Um, there's a handout here that's a little bit of room if you want to jot anything down. Um, if you kind of take a quick walk through it, you'll see there's a little bit of um, background that really is non-church related, it's business related, but I think that um, it has some very good lessons for us. And then on the second page, we're going to talk about some of the practical ways that um, our leadership shows in rehearsals and so forth. And the session at 915 is devoted to gestural leadership. So one is really meant to go to the next. So if we have more people at the second one, you'll be responsible for bringing them up to speed. Um, little background. This is under one, one thing. Have you ever heard that expression that... Uh, Robert Burns, who was a Scottish poet, and I can't say it with a Scottish accent, but in one of his poems he said, Ah, if we had the gift to see ourselves as others see us, have you heard that? I did a little research on that and found out that oddly enough that poem had to do with, it was written from the perspective of somebody sitting in church behind a woman who had a rather uh, ornate hat on and there was a bead flying around the hat. And I, I had no idea that it would have come from anything like that, but the, the idea was that I guess she could have realized that her hat was in fact was lost for me or whatever it was. She was having a different perspective on things. But I have heard it used in relation to personality <coughs> or in relation to action. And my parents, my dad was a minister, and um, kind of old school, which is fine. I learned a lot of good lessons from that. Always told my sister and me that we had to behave all the time, thinking about how others were seeing us, you know, and um, setting up a good model and so forth. And we lived in a small, relatively small town of 10,000 people. And so everybody knew, you know, who the minister's kids were, so we were supposed to behave all the time so that our inner self and our outer self were compatible. I don't think that was always true, but... Um, it was the goal in the house. So for me personally, growing up as a child, I was quite shy. I have an older sister who was seven years older and very outgoing. I mean, just, she could just talk to her off and did from the time she was little. But people liked that. They responded well to that. So there was never any reason for me to do much when we were together. So if we were somewhere with our parents, Bonnie, my sister, was trying to take over and I would just be the you know, a little one following along. Um, always, you know, played second violin in the orchestra, liked to play the bottom part of the duets. If I was singing in a trio, I wanted to be right in the middle where I wasn't singing the melody and it wasn't too noticeable. Um, the last one that we picked for the baseball team, and that was for good reason. That was for really good reason. Um, not ever an officer in choir at school. In fact, I come into choir, but I didn't want to have any responsibilities like that. I was kind of a good citizen, went along, did my work, tried to get good grades, but did not ever want to stand up. So why would I end up getting involved in the American Choral Directors Association, for example, and being on the executive committee? Well, who knows? And I have friends who I know in their personal lives are quite shy but are able to get up in a situation and be strong leaders. So the way we are inside is not always the way that we appear to be on the outside. I had students who were quite shy and were concerned about how they would survive in the classroom. And I always tell them there's, to a certain extent, there's a bit of acting that goes on, especially, you know, when they're 21 or 22 and they're student teaching in a high school and they're 18 year olds there. Those kids want the student teachers to be their buddies and their friends. But there's certain things that they can do to almost act into the role and eventually it becomes second nature. Now by that I don't mean they should be insincere. I would never ever suggest that. But we have to take on certain roles sometimes. So when you're in front of your choir, or in front of a new choir, for example, you know we're all nervous in that situation. The first day in a new job, everybody's nervous. But if that's what you let take over your persona, then what happens to people's confidence in you? So you have to narrow the gap, we all do, between what we might feel inside or who we are sometimes and what we have to project on the outside for the sake of the job or the requirements you're ready to do. So that's what I mean by leadership in the inner world of the self versus the outer world of the observer. 
Now, leadership style and the coral conductor. First of all, leadership is multifaceted. How many of you spend quite a bit of your time doing administrative tasks in your job? Absolutely. How many of you feel you're good at that? How many of you like it? Oh, good for you. Um, how many of you feel that you would rather do the musical things than all of the other things? Anybody have that sense? I think a lot of us being creative individuals would like to do that. Now let's say we're really good at the musical side of things, but we're not so good at the organizational side, but we have to do it. We don't have a volunteer who's going to organize the church choir library for us, or you know, if we're teaching in high school, we don't have a very good parent group yet, and we're going to have to work on that. What do we do? We have to learn to do it well. So leadership is not just about standing up and having great gestures, it's about all those other things. I am astounded in my own job how much time I spend on email every day. What did we do before we did that? <laughs> oh my gosh! First of all, I don't think we were in touch with as many people. I'm sure that I wasn't getting these little short questions from my students. I mean, they figure those things out on their own. Now I think they just exist to sit there at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, okay. Um, and Dr. Bradley was um, saying yesterday that his wife teaches English and that she will often notice on the day that a paper is due, there'll be a whole string of emails the students have sent her overnight about, now do you want this, do you want that? As if she's sitting there at her computer just waiting for all that stuff to happen. <laughs> and what it really says to us as teachers is, you know, you just didn't prepare. You did not do your work and now you're asking. But I spend easily three hours a day. Now if I spent that much time studying scores, oh my gosh, I could just, everything would be memorized. But it's part of the job. It's just part of what we have to do now. And you know in church music, the number of meetings you go to that are seemingly unrelated to the music ministry. But if you're not there, then you're not informed, and we can't afford that, can we? So we all have to do all these things. Leadership just has many, many faces to it. The second thing, and I bring this up here because I think it's really important, is that the root word, conducaro, which is Latin, means to lead, that's one side, and to care. And I think there's nowhere more than in church music ministry where that is absolutely the truth. If you are the director of music or you're the conductor of choirs or handbells, you know it's a ministry and so much of what we do has to be with caring for the membership. I'll talk a little bit this afternoon about how the church choir is a relational group in a congregation. For some people, that's their key relational group. Now, we may feel sometimes that this isn't such a case, maybe with a school or something like that, but it absolutely is. Everywhere we go, we're leading through our knowledge of the music, but we're also leading in showing how we care about the individuals. I've often thought art is the only profession where, you know, we can stand up and do what it is people think we do, but if there's nobody there with us, there's complete silence. There's no music. My life as a conductor depends on other people. If I were a pianist, I could choose to play solo literature only, not collaborate, and you'd hear the music. But we can't do that as conductors. So it's very important to keep that in balance. Now C, defining leadership. It's the easiest definition I know. It's the ability to get a group of people to do something together, to work toward a common goal. And you know sometimes that's a little easier said than done. Um, it just depends on the context. Now, characteristics of leadership. What do you think we mean here by professional qualities? For you as a church musician, what are some of the musical characteristics or aspects of your leadership? Anybody? What do you have to be able to do as a musician? Sarah, I know your name, I'm going to pick on you. Read music. Read music. Oh my goodness, yes, but I have to tell you, the person who runs our praise band at church does not read music. Great ear. Wonderful ear. And actually uh, composes a lot of music, but doesn't can't write it down. But he's got MIDI and all kinds of things that do that for him. What else? Um, you have to be able to interpret the music so that you can tell the choir what right. you want from it. Right. You have to be able to interpret the music. So you have the reading, the notational level, and then you have that reading level that enables you to interpret the music because that's part of our job as teachers and conductors to help convey the composition. Attention. And so that's knowledge that, you know, when I think about students who say, oh, I hate going to music history and I hate going to theory. 
Well, you know what? You're going to need a lot of that stuff, and that's where you pull all that together. You may not do it in a super technical way, but you have to have the knowledge. Good. What are some other musical things that you do? Well, yes. just uh, <clears throat> excuse me, both verbal and nonverbal communication. Absolutely, verbal and nonverbal communication. Being able to say succinctly what it is that you hear to improve something. And then as a conductor, finding a way to show that in gestures, because as I always tell my students, I cannot tell you this in the concert. <laughs> so I try to work to make the rehearsal a little less verbal so that they are having to watch. But that's an excellent assessment of the, the conducting leadership. Anything else musical? Yes? You've got to be able to select the music, absolutely, because that is your, that's the menu, that's the spiritual musical food, spiritual splash musical food you're giving them. So absolutely, you've got to have the knowledge to do that. What else? Anything else? Yes? You have to spend some time preparing yourself. You have to spend time preparing it so that you're not running in at the last minute <coughs> and kind of reading it together with them or just barely staying a step ahead. A lot of what we do is in the preparation stage. So if we were to put all that stuff in order and think, you know, we've got to, we have to have the musical knowledge to be able to read it, we have to be able to select it, then we have to be able to present it to the group. There are a lot of musical responsibilities. Um, that's the professional side. What about the personal qualities of leadership? Well, one is presentation. Would you just stand for a minute? We're going to work on this a little bit. <coughs> the context, what they understand, the terminology, all those kinds of things. 
don't talk down, don't talk, you know, finding <coughs> that middle ground. And then how can you tell if you're getting it? A lot of facial expression, right. Their body language back to you. You can tell. You know, if there's kind of a quizzical look, or if there's a look of disinterest, <coughs> it's kind of cut off, or the body language shuts down, all those kinds of things will tell you. And we have to be sensitive enough that we can pick up on them. What else? Yes, a direct, concise instruction. Direct, concise instruction. Somebody, I think it's Charlie Nurch that said something about seven words or less. I remember um, at the Oregon Bach Festival, Helmut Rill, who you know is just a fabulous musician, said that when you're talking to the orchestra, you should use pairs of terms. And I thought, you know, this could work with the choir too, except that they may feel it's a little dehumanizing. He said, when you talk to orchestral musicians, you're talking in terms of short and long. Shorter bow, longer bow, that kind of thing. Shorter, longer for articulation. You're talking about louder, softer, dynamics. You're talking about smoother, more detached articulation. And you always do things in the inner part. And he's just a model of efficiency in rehearsal. His English is really wonderful. It's accented, but it's really good. But he'll just look at the violins and say shorter. He doesn't have to say that should be martelet or anything else. They know what that means. Now, sometimes I think with singers, that can come across as being a little brusque. Singers, you know, we have egos. And we like to be treated. And certainly in, in the volunteer choir setting, I try to be very careful to be concise but not be grim about the language. In my case, because I'm soft-spoken, when I do go into that mode, people think I'm mad at me. <clears throat> And then that makes me feel bad, and then there's this whole circle of psychological mess. All right, social intelligence. What is social intelligence? You actually hinted at it. Somebody said, did you say something about body language before? Oh, the facial expression. Social intelligence has to do with the ability to read those cues from other people. Um, Howard Gardner talked this is years old now, but he sort of developed this theory of seven intelligences and multiple intelligences. Music is one, linguistic is one, but social is one of them. And the idea is some people with very limited social intelligence don't converse well, they do, but they mostly don't read cues. Have you ever talked to anybody who comes right up to your face, and, you know, like this, and you just find yourself back all the time until you're at the wall? Um, their social intelligence may be a little hindered because they don't realize that they're impinging on their space. And that sense of personal space is really important. That's just one example. But we hope that as conductor leaders, we have a good sense of social intelligence. And I, I dare say that we do. I think people who work with people and do it successfully, that that's one of the things that they are strong. Now, a little background for you, history of leadership. If Somebody were to say to you, leadership is a trait, T-R-A-I-T. What does that mean? It's just part of who you are, right. And back in the history of leadership, there was a group of people who were very strong in their beliefs that, that you are a leader or you're not. In other words, leaders are born and not made. And I think every one of us knows that inside of ourselves we have got some leadership characteristics. Now I told you that I didn't want to play first violin and this, that, and the other thing. But I was organized, which is a good characteristic of a leader. I was very responsible. I was conscientious. I would get things done. I would get back to people. Those are parts of leadership. They may not be as sort of overt or charismatic or any of that kind of thing, but they're parts of leadership that are important and that will be helpful in that. So this theory says leaders are born. Is there any truth in that? Yes, a little bit. Now, the people who said not behavioral felt, however, that even though you could be born with the, the leanings toward leadership, there were certain behaviors of leadership that one could learn. So for example, can you think of any? And there are many right answers to this question. What are some aspects, behaviors of leadership? You've already exemplified some this morning. 
can learn to present yourself with confidence. Right, you can learn to present yourself with confidence. So what is it, the Dale, Dale Carnegie courses that people take to learn how to be um, good public speakers and Toastmasters Club and that kind of thing? There are certain things that you can do to learn how to present with confidence. That is a behavior. What would be some other behaviors that are, are teachable? Think about people you've worked with as mentors. What have you been able to teach them? Yes. Not along that lines, but organization. Yeah, yeah. Now, it may not be comfortable for some people, but there are certain strategies, absolutely, that we can learn to organize. And I really think that technology is one assistance to that that can help us be organized. I have a son who is just notorious. He's um, ADD to some extent. But very bright, the kind of kid that from the time he was little, you know, I'd say, Christopher, did you hear what I said? And he, blah, 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 blah. but he was, you know, all over the place. And I remember in eighth grade, this was old days, um, taking him to a counselor because he just couldn't keep anything organized. And her suggestion at that time was folders of different colors for different subjects. Believe it or not, it worked. Well, now how he keeps himself organized is that he has got. Um, I think it's his iPhone now because he switches all the time. Everything's in there. All of his appointments for work, everything is there. If he lost it, he'd be in trouble. But that technology is enabling him to function as a more organized person so that he doesn't miss things at work at home. Thank goodness, because even though he's 27, I'm his mother and I still worry. But I don't call him or nag. Honest, I don't. But, but that can be an assistant organization, that kind of thing. So if it, if it works for you, use it. Now, C, which has two asterisks besides situational leadership. This was actually developed in a business school at Ohio State University long before I taught there. And I bet you can figure out what the people who developed this theory believe about leadership. Take the word situational and just stretch a little from there. If you were a situational leadership theorist, what would you say about leadership? Yes. Well, that it would depend on the situation. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really a leader. Sometimes. <laughs> it depends on the situation. How you lead is dependent on the situation. Absolutely. So let's think about that in terms of ourselves as conductors. Let's think about some different kinds of um, scenarios. Let's suppose that you were invited to go in for a publishing company. You're going to have a choir. They're going to do some CDs of some new music releases. And you have a day to do it, a little time to read through, and then you start leading the choir. What will your leadership style be like in that setting? Now we're going to think about it in terms of a couple of things. One is we're going to think about it in terms of the task. Right, and your emphasis on getting the job done. Then we're also going to think about it in terms of relationship and how you relate to the people. And then to some extent, we're going to think about the motivation of the followers. Now in this case, let's assume these folks are being paid to sing, all right? And being paid reasonably well, all right? Think about your leadership style in terms of task. Are you going to put more emphasis on getting the job done or more emphasis on being a nice, friendly person? Uh, Absolutely, getting the job done. You are going to be matter of fact, you're going to get right down to business, and they're probably not going to mind because they know why they're getting it. We've got a day and we have to get this done as a project. Can you think of any situation in your current job where you might have to do something like that? On some level, for example. Also, the teacher, because I teach school, yep. I will need the yep. educator to talk, tell us what we're going to discuss. Right. You have it, we all hate meetings. So there's an agenda, and you just need to get through it. And it's not about warm fuzzies at that point. That's why you have your socializing and all that kind of thing, but you have to get it done. Any other situations? Yes. You said you could call a rehearsal of orchestra. Absolutely. You've got that orchestra there for one rehearsal. And you're probably paying them handsomely. And even if you're not, you know, they're instrumentalists and you're a choral conductor and oh, all that stuff. <laughs> and you have to get the job done. And your singers understand. They've gone through the nurturing process with you. They understand. So you're going to be very 
true task oriented and less relationship oriented. Now, think about your normal rehearsals that you went into Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever it is. What about the balance between task and relationship oriented? Both high, both low, one high, one low, what do you think? I think your your singers or your instrumentals to work harder if they uh, if you have built that relationship and you'll actually be able to do the tax more if right right and it's a constant balancing act isn't it you really have to work at that and I found working with volunteers whether it's in the women's glee club at school they get credit for it but they are mostly not music majors they're there because they love to be there but if I become the wicked witch of the west. They will not be there anymore. And so we have to work for that relationship, and certainly in the church, that's very important. Can you think of any situation where you would be low on task and low on relationship as a style? Do you think it would work? <laughs> I don't think in music making it could ever work. Now, in the business world, they call that laissez faire, and it's the kind of manager who just delegates to everybody else and then removes him or herself from the presence. I can't imagine that's particularly effective either. The ones that conductors sort of shine on through all the research that's been done, whether they're band, orchestra, or choir people, is high task and high relationship. There are a lot of different assessments that can be taken about this, both from the, the singer, musician assessing you, and you doing your own um, leadership style. But those are the ones, and that makes sense. And if you think about it in our, especially in church situations, that is so important. But um, you know, in school teaching, for example, if one of your students has done something that is just remarkable, plays on the football team and got the touchdown Friday night, it is essential that you are, if you weren't in the game, that you are there with that kid on Monday morning congratulating him and the whole class is hearing it, that you celebrate all those things together. That's part of the leadership too, because that's building the relationship. They need to know that you know there are people outside. That first situation that we talked about, it's okay. You're going in to get a job done. Now, some people have asked me about, well, isn't that what happens when you go do an honor choir or something? You have two days and you just have to get stuff done. Mm -mm. In the first 10 minutes, you have to establish some kind of relationship with them or you have lost them for the next two days. And you know when you put all of your church choirs together and you bring somebody in, you can pretty much tell in the first 10 minutes if people are won over or they're not one. And then it just becomes gradually. So it's a, a model that, it, that started in the business world and, and in education that kind of swept over there, but I think has a lot of implications for us as musicians. Now the last ones there, transactional and transformational, are, are newer models. Um, transactional has to do with the product, and transformational has maybe more to do with what we call charismatic. Um, that kind of winning, uh, personality, and we know people like that who, by the sheer force of their personality, can get people to do things. Sometimes it's not a good thing. I mean, think what Hitler did, or you know, all kinds of things like that. That's a strong personality, but that's not charisma for uh, good human ends. All right, so we talked a little bit about the task for leadership and motivation. <clears throat> Indulge me here a little bit. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on F, gender issues. Not only because there are women in the room, but I think because men um, need to, to be sensitive to things that relate to gender issues, sort of know what the, the boundaries are. So I'm going to uh, tell you a couple of little stories about this. So I think there have been some um, misconceptions that have developed. I know that people think that, or I have encountered this in my own life, that a woman choral conductor is going to be very flowery and her gestures and hard to follow. For some instrumentalists tend to think that that's the way we conduct everything regardless of gender. So there, there are several issues and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when I went to OSU in 1993, I was the only woman uh, director of choral activities for, for uh, I wasn't at that time, I didn't go in, in that I was in the university, but I was the only woman conductor in the Big Ten in the choral period. Now that's pretty astounding, 1993. I know that's 16 years ago, but good grief. That's ridiculous. That's not the case now. However, at OSU, I am still the only woman conductor of anything. We've had a couple of women doctoral students. 
who have conducted groups, but in terms of faculty, no, which I find just appalling. It's not that they're not out there. The last opening we had was for Men's Glee Club, and in that case, I could understand. I have to say, there's some gender things there, that it's probably much um, easier and more comfortable for those men to relate to another man than it would be for women. I can tell when I go in the room if I have to do any part of rehearsal with them. I think they're cleaning up their language as I walk in the door. <laughs> because all of a sudden it's like, you know, and then it's kind of like, Mom's here, and we better behave, kind of thing. But boy, what goes on behind those doors when they're with their old male conductor? I'm, I don't want to be in the, I just don't want to be in the frat room or the locker room or wherever it is. Here are some things that people have said to me about being a female conductor. And this is one. You don't conduct one bit like a woman. Now that was meant to be a compliment. <laughs> now do you think a man said that or a woman said that? A man, a man said that. I still don't like that man. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this is ridiculous. Some psychologists would just have a field day and throw thousands of dollars to something. <laughs> I was very young, and I didn't have the, the leadership chutzpah to be able to say, oh, what do you mean? I just was kind of speechless. And I knew he meant well, but you know, when I got away from it, I thought, oh, that's kind of offensive. Anyway, I, um, I don't see that person anymore. It's kind of out of my, my life, so I, but I carry that bitterness <laughs> right now. The second one, you conduct pretty well for a woman. <laughs> man or woman? Woman! A woman said that. That was about my audition at my church job. There was a woman on the search committee and they came to the university to watch me and that is what she said to me after. She conducted pretty well for a woman. Oh my God. <laughs> now here's another one. This was a question that came to me in an email from a female graduate student who was doing some kind of research. This is how the question was worded. What are the difficulties of being a woman conductor? Now think about how loaded a question that is. Could she have changed that now into something more appropriate? Conductor in general. Conductor in general would have been fine with me. She could have said challenges. Okay. That's okay, that seems a little more neutral to me. But it was interesting that it came from a woman. What are the difficulties of being a woman conductor? So I wrote back to her and essentially said that uh, except for those kinds of comments, I really had not encountered a great deal of that and that I thought regardless of gender, if you're well prepared and you are a strong leader, that it really doesn't matter. I think that it can, can be... Um, that gender can be a disadvantage if you let it be. But I think for women, it's important that we don't. And, and gentlemen, just be careful what you say to us, because you know we're a very sensitive lot. And that is true. Um, so is choral conducting mostly a man's world? I observe in the college world that it is more, not so much in high school, and I've really pondered about that. I think it may have to do with uh, the balance of raising families that depending on if, if people want children and depending on when they arrive, whether or not they can go on for grad school to get a doctorate. Um, my son was arrived at the end of the second year in doctoral studies and my daughter arrived two days after I finished my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Now if you had told me that's the way the world was going to work, I would have said, oh no, I can't possibly do this. But the fact was I had the graduate work done enough to the extent that, you know, then there were the children there and, and everything was okay. But I had friends who chosen to teach high school and love it and just said, you know what, I can't go back. I can't make the sacrifice to go back to school because of the age of my kids or whatever. And they don't want to wait till the kids are older because then they're 45 or 50 and that's tough to do. I did have a student a couple of years ago who came back to school at 45 and um, she had one young child and one older one, and she's now in a college job. How happy she can be. She had taught public school for 22 years. She's a fabulous teacher, but I could observe the sacrifices she made for that to happen. And it would have been easier for her to stay teaching high school, but she felt she had a gift for teaching prospective teachers, and I think she really does. So she chose to do that. Um, in our field, we've got some really strong models of women that you've probably heard of. Um, Elaine Brown, Philadelphia, same city, she's not living anymore, but Margaret Hopkins lived in Milwaukee, Symphony for a long time, of course. 
Um, Margaret Hill of Chicago, Ann Howard Jones right now is one of the strongest women models that we have. She's Robert Shaw's assistant. Um, there are lots of people. So I think being female is going to hold us back if we're good. It's not going to hold you back if you're male and you're good either. What's going to hold us back is not having good leadership styles, regardless of, of gender. Um, we're going to talk a little more about, about women when we get to the business of dress, which we have to address. All right, let's look at the second page. One of you said, it's the gentleman from Florida, who said preparation. Um, these are, are aspects of leadership in action. Know your stuff. Somebody said that before as well. You have to know what you're about. So when you go into that rehearsal, you have to have done your homework again. For me, score study is a really important component of that. Spending time looking at the music, figuring out what's in it, what are the components, and how I'm going to teach it. So that when I walk in, I have a game plan. Now, I still am so obsessive compulsive about things. I still write down the sketch of the rehearsal. And I also kind of time it. So I know if you've got four things to get through, and you know in church part, it's usually more than that, that by a certain time, we need to have moved on to something. That rehearsal that you were talking about with the cantata and the orchestra, you need to know when you're going to have to move on. You have to time that again. So that's part of our preparation, too. Question? Yes. Um, could you talk just a little bit about balancing the, the time issue and also if you have uh, gone into, you've prepared with your score and you go into rehearsal mm -hmm. and you discover it's not working or what I thought right. should be right. isn't. Isn't working. That's where our flexibility comes into play. And if I miss something because I didn't anticipate that this would be as difficult or whatever it was, it's usually that we've misread the hard stuff. You know, if, if it goes quicker than you think, well, that's bonus time, then you can spend it somewhere else. But if it goes more slowly, sometimes if we really get into a brick wall, I realize I need to come back, and I'll just say to the group, I need to take another look at this, we're going to move on to the next thing. And then I kind of keep my despair to myself. Occasionally, it's something, I remember doing an anthem by Alice Parker, but I really, um, I can't remember the name of it. It was about three years ago, and I really liked it. It was in 5-4, and it really fit with the lectionary and everything. I thought, this would be great. And boy, I'll tell you, they could not get it. And then the frustration became so apparent, I just scratched it, and we found another one. And everybody went, like that. So that's kind of a, a worst-case scenario. But then I know if we make up time by working, maybe I'm going to get ahead, and something I was going to do next week I can actually do now. So then next week I have to spend more time on everything. Does that answer your question? Okay. You want to try to figure out is it them or is it me? And I usually look here first. Um, you know, not be clear or not be sequential. But occasionally it's a it's a personality issue. I mean, I've gone to rehearsal where I see, oh my gosh, three of the key bases are not here tonight. So and so is important, and somebody else is, you know, in this place and that place. Boy, we're not going to get whatever is done with that hard base card. So maybe next week I'll have a second. That's always a difficulty with volunteer clients when you're not having a certain time at the time. Rehearsal preparation, learn to sing all the parts, practice the piano, um, practice the conducting. If there are tough things like the fermato, you need to know how long you want to hold that and not be practicing on the group. And then sequential strategies for optimal learning. One thing you might put there, um, is whole to part to whole, which as a, a teaching framework can make a lot of sense. Give them an overview of the piece, whether you play a recording or you, you play it through or they sing it all the way through if they can. Then you work on the details and then you want to put it back together and there's some kind of podium. Presentation and rehearsal schedule. Oh, yes, of course. Um, this is kind of gender related, but it applies to the guys too. Yeah. Learn to sing all the parts. In your How range. important is it to try to sing? You know why I do that? It's not to sing it for you. It's so I know what the tough spots are. If I go through the bass line and there's some awkward intervals, sometimes unless I do that myself, I miss it. I don't have the feeling of how hard that is. But if I'm really glad you asked that question. Because if what you're asking is, are you going to sing all the parts to them? No. No, I'm not. I know that sometimes we're going to double with the piano or we're going to do whatever. I try never to bang out the parts. 
Fortunately, in the situation where I was for 15 years, the reading level got better and better, so we didn't have to do that. And when somebody at school says, will you just play that, the other students look at them, they go, where have you been? You don't know Dr. A very well, because they don't do that, just have to read it. But that actually, if you are seeing all the time from your singer, it's really harmful on your voice. And I've heard women, particularly in junior high and high school, who will try to sing with the boys all the time, and then, the, you know, they're way down here, and they've lost all the talk. So I think there are other, I would more rather use the piano than I would all the time in my own voice. And that's the case where maybe if you have one bass who really knows that part of one tenor, even to have them sing it for the other people is better. But good question, thanks for asking. Um, anything else so far before we go on? All right, visual presentation. Posture stand, stand like a singer. Set up position, we're gonna work more on this in the next um, hour, but let's just have a quick preview of that. Would you stand again? And imagine that you were about to do that. So in the back row, 
you know, like the people in the front can't escape. They pretty much have to look because you know proximity is a good thing. You know, you walk right over like this, and then everybody else. Questions before I look up? Yeah. Yeah. As long as my head is never in the store, yeah. I almost never. Yeah. You and just have to be working all the time. And I think that's a good reason for making eye contact with specific people. They know that you are going to look at them at some point. They have to be more accountable. But that is an issue with with flyers. Um, when I first went, I tend to conduct small as much as I used to, but the bases in the back, so I said, can you just conduct bigger? And I said, can you just watch bigger? <laughs> <laughs> so it you know, was a joke for a little while, but I think we compromised on that. All right, dress, be appropriate and non-distracting. When you wear a robe as you do in church, that's not an issue, provided the robe is clean and hanging on and all that kind of stuff. If you're in concert performance, that's where I think for the women it's more of an issue. The dress of conductor, regardless of gender, should never distract from the music. And, and women have more choices in fashion than men do. I think men look terrific in a suit, tucks, whatever in the back, it's great. It fits, it looks good. But you know, we're looking in our closet saying, oh, what will we do today? Will it be the one with the ruffles in the back or the, you know, the slit up the side or whatever it is? Distracting, conservative, it's not about you. And then I always say look in the mirror before you walk out and just make sure for the last um, minute check. It's frustrating but understandable how sometimes a person's dress, women's dress, will be more the topic of conversation than how effective the music was. And I'm sure you can all think of situations like that. I, I have got some horror stories that you can just take my word on. That didn't happen to me personally, but I deserve it. Okay, auditory. How you say something is more important than what you say. So if I say to you, turn page four, turn page four, kind of roll again, it doesn't sound as authoritative as if I say, please turn to page four, and I make it like a statement. It's a simple thing. But, and people will get used to it. You always walk at the end of their sentences and think, well, that's just the way you talk. But even in a simple little thing like that, or if there's a little edge to your voice, for example, if you're getting a little testy or frustrated, and that slips out in your voice, and you bark a command, you know, people all of a sudden tense up. Does that mean you have to be nice all the time? You can never show your frustration? Of course not. You need to be humor if you have it. But the way we show it is very important. So the tone of what we say, even more than the content, and there have been some studies in this that indicate as much as 60% of people's understanding is driven toward the tone. So we want a well-modulated voice and all that kind of thing, not harsh, not too loud, but loud enough. Many things to think about that, that we just don't think, oh my goodness, I'm going to be conductor, do I have to do this too? Yes. Speaking voice needs to be modulated, projected, but not harsh. Assertive. Remember, inflection is important. Don't trail off and go up at the end of the sentence. Speech tempo. Some people speak very quickly, and some people don't. So if you always speak slowly, it may be good for comprehension, but it may also be natural. Why do you speak too quickly? Can't be followed. And I know sometimes in rehearsal, I do that because I know exactly where I'm going and I want to get it all out there and they're really still that processing the first thing. So no more than two bits of information at a time because they're not going to remember anything more than that. But just watch speech tempo. If you couple too quick speech with bad articulation, it's just a mumble. Again, working with older adults, there may be hearing issues so you have to be sure that you're being very clear and assertive and that kind of thing. Ladies, here's something else. If you don't play dumb or cute, tape yourself. If you don't like what you hear, and some of us don't like the quality of our voice, maybe it is okay to go to a speech therapist. They can do a lot of things with inflection, with the, I always say this particularly if you're having tension, but I also say from the point of view of having had students with perhaps a very nasal voice or something like that, that I knew in the classroom was going to be problematic. And sometimes some very easy relaxation exercises can help with that. 
All right, kinesthetic, avoid weak gestures. What's a weak gesture? Can you stand up and give a model of one? Just something that's a weak, conducting gesture? Stand up and look weak. Oh, there's one right over there. Yeah, yeah, there's one over there. With a big right. Now, you, this is a great combination because we've got the, the elbow right here tucked in. And <laughs>
listen to music when I'm home. I have some friends who say, I'm done. At the end of the day, I don't want to hear it anymore, but I'm not quite there yet. Maybe I will, but I'm just not that tired yet. But it kind of worries me. But then they have other hobbies, they have things they put. Do you listen to music when you're working on the houses at home? Yeah. And different kinds of music can be your too. I was going to say, you listen to something. Yeah, yeah. Something that's not. Um, I listen to books on CD. I have a drive for about 30 minutes to work more if the traffic's bad. And I listen to NPR, or, and it kind of feeds me, gets me thinking about stuff, or just different kind of music that I wouldn't. Not something that I can do with the choir, but instrumental music. I love piano music. I love chime music. Stuff like that. You don't think it's nerdy, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other non musical topics you can think of? I think, for me, it was music was my. And music ministry in the local church was, yeah. was my calling, my right. life. and so I thought that was that that was my singular passion and pursuit, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and um, and it, it's helped me to find in the in recent years to find another passion and pursuit. And I found that that in the midst, and so I started a, a business I do on my days off, but oh. it it makes all the difference in the world because it is that it has been a time of deposit. Yeah, is it okay to ask what your business? Yeah, I detail cars. Oh my gosh, good for you. And see, here's another thing, and I, I never would have said this 10 years ago, but those of us who get closer and closer to retirement, if all we have is the music, and there's no other way of getting deposits, and all of a sudden you're not in that position anymore, who are you? So I began to think, you know, what am I going to do? The things I've not been able to do, like volunteering at the hospital and stuff like that, I'm dying to do that. I want to work with one of the theater groups in town behind the scenes. I mean, I'm no real the actor or anything, but I've always wanted to get, I love theater and I want to get involved in that. Can't do it now, but we have to kind of start thinking about those things. <coughs> so if you retire from the church, you can have your own, just make that. Well, the other one, the motivation was it for it was that my daughter wanted to come to Bayou University. <laughs> 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 and I think the tuition is very high. Good, but it, it provides a way for my family to do that and it helps with taxes. And, See, that's you know, true. It's a great thing. That's true. We are resourceful people. We always find a way. Um, and the last thing is the nutrition, sleep, exercise, spiritual growth. I think in the church, um, I can't always say this in a non. I have to be careful teaching in a state school. I can't talk about it. These things, which is ironic, you know, when you're teaching music with a sacred text that you have to be so careful. So it's nice not to have to do that. But the spiritual growth, finding a way, because we are spiritual leaders of our choirs and our organizations, how are we fed spiritually? I've always thought it would be tough to work in a church where the minister was not, um, you know, where I, for me, if I don't hear good preaching, it's, it's tougher. I love to be able to go to church and be fed that way as well as fed through the music. So, you know, whatever, whatever you find, focus, focus, focus. It points to quiet time, and that's a tough thing to do. You know, in the plane yesterday, I picked up one of those sky mall things. I was quite bored at the end of the plane. And there's this thing in there about a new kind of toothbrush that you can now brush your teeth in. It takes 40 seconds off the time it takes to brush your teeth. And I thought, please. Are we that <laughs> are we that desperate in our lives that now we have to think about how we can save time brushing our teeth to do something else? We are so programmed. I like brushing my teeth. You know, it's a little downtime. Right? 